version today a little bit. <laughs> Let me see. Come on. Come on. No. No. I'm not going to play with it. Good morning. This will be an interesting recording this morning. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate your presence very much and hope you appreciate our study this morning. Before Pilate, in John 18 and verse 33, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now this is a sort of an interesting statement that is a little bit confusing because of the way we use the term. Jesus lived on this world. And for that matter, we live on this world. So what is he talking about? We can read over in the first chapter of Mark in verse 15, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So lo and behold, the kingdom was at hand at that moment. In Colossians, the first chapter in verse 12, 13, we're giving thanks unto the Father hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who had delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we're in the kingdom of his dear son. What does he mean when he says the kingdom's not of this world? In fact, we go just a little bit further into Revelation 1 and verse 9. I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle called Patmos. So John was our brother and was in the kingdom there in Revelation, the first chapter. So what does the Lord mean when he says it's not of this world? In some sense, obviously, the kingdom was on this earth, on this globe. So what is he talking about is the subject we want to see today. But Jesus says no it's not. It's not of this world. Obviously, he meant something other than the things discussed in these other passages. We have to come to some other understanding of what he means by, my kingdom is not of this world. In 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, the Lord said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Love not the world. Now what in the world is that talking about? Is he talking about... The trees and the grass and the, the dirt and the hills and the valleys and the rivers and the seas. Love not the world. It should begin to suggest something to you when he says, it, neither the things, the things that are in the world, when he says all that is in the world is the lust after the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, does that begin to suggest something other than the trees and hills and valleys? You know, there's various uses in the Bible, and I'm not even going to exhaust all those uses. 
In John 21, for instance, in verse 25, this word world is used. He says, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So here, this word world conveys the idea of the globe, the earth. The earth isn't big enough to hold all the books that could have been written about the life of Jesus and the things that he did and the things that he accomplished. Well, that's the way we normally think of it. Sort of the world means the globe. I think of the spinning globe. But there's other uses. The word, the word actually here in Greek is the word cosmos. Now, I don't think anybody here is a practitioner of that, but there are some who are take advantage of it. Do any of you ladies, you don't go to a barber more than likely. You go to a cosmetologist. And she practices the arts of cosmetology on you. That's where this word comes from. It comes from the word cosmos. But another use that's made of it is the, word, is the universe. For instance, in Hebrews 4 and verse 3, We which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So here, it's everything. Everything God did was finished at the foundation of the world. You can see another place it's used in uh, Romans 1 and verse 20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Notice that. The creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. There it seems to be referring to this creation. Everything that's involved in it. And the Greeks often used the word cosmos to refer to the universe. The word actually means order or arrangement of things, arrangement of systems. And thus it's used in 1 Peter, the third chapter in verse 3, in a sensible way the way that I just mentioned to you a moment ago and gave you ladies an example of, who's adorning, it's speaking of wives, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Hmm, what's their word there? Well, it's that word adorning. Who's adorning? That's the word world that's used here. It's the orderly arrangement of things, the systematic arrangement of things. So most of you, I suspect, when you got up this morning and before you headed to church, you used a little cosmetology on yourselves, right? Come on. You looked in the mirror and you tried to make an orderly arrangement of things, right? Now, two or three of you boys didn't. Uh, I noticed <laughs> you just kind of flopped out and here you are. Your mother tried to help a little bit, but that's the way it is. But most of these lovely ladies made an orderly arrangement of things before they came. And it's what the word means. They made, they made their world right. There's a number of places it's used. And I'm going to go through these rather quickly. So hang on with me in, uh, you might notice this passage. He says in, uh, this is, I believe it, I've, I've lost my Bible reference, but I believe it's John 7. Yes, I'm pretty sure of it. It's John 7, verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify that the works thereof are evil. Do you see the way the word world is being used there? It's not referring to the globe. It's not referring to the universe. It's not referring to anything other than the system of things in this world, the way this world works. He says, the world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. The arrangement of this world, 
this cosmos hates Jesus. It's in opposition to Jesus. Notice in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, Paul says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world. This was a system. He's not talking about airwaves. He's not talking about, you know, the trees and the valleys. He's talking about the system of things, the intelligence, the rationality, the working of this world, how it's ordered and arranged. And he says, we haven't received anything from the intelligence and wisdom and order of this world, which is contrary to Christ. He says, but the spirit, which is of God, that's where the arrangement has come from. In Galatians 4, verse 3, he says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. You see that word again? We weren't in bondage, we weren't in bondage to Washington. It's not talking about our servile situation going to work every Monday morning. Under the elements of the world, the order and arrangement of this world the sin that is afflicting us, the evil that is around us, we're in bondage to that. That order, that arrangement. He says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. We were in bondage and to the world system existing. In Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. That is the system that exists among us. In James 1, verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now right now we're having a great thaw, which is always, I either prefer warm weather or cold weather, because the in-between is mud. There is no way you can get from my house to my office without being spotted by the world. But that's not what this verse is talking about. <laughs> This verse is talking about the system, the order, the arrangement, the sin, the evil that is contrary to Christ's will that exists in this world. And you're to keep yourself unspotted from that. A last one in this connection, look in 1 John 4, verse 4. He says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've gotten out of that system of things, that way of thinking, that order that exists in this world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God. Do you see that contrast? Jesus had come in combat with the world order that existed not then to deliver us from it. Notice a couple of other ideas. Jesus had created both the globe and a system of laws for our conduct. And that had been perverted and destroyed by men. That's what John 1 is talking about, where we read. I've forgotten who read. I think Matt did. He says, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What's the world there? It's not talking about being born. It's talking about this evil system that exists around us. He was in the world, Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. He had created the laws by which the world was supposed to function. And men weren't listening to them. They had created their own order of things. And the world knew him not. They refused. That's what he says. 
Jesus said to us, we read over there in chapter 7, verse 7, he says, the world hates me because I testify of its evil. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That system that was in place, put in place by God originally, that was there to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, the laws that had been ordained to make that possible, he came to people who should have recognized that, and they should have received him, but they didn't because they were under the laws that existed in the world. That system, that organization, that cosmetology, if you will. Jesus came not just to the globe, but to do battle with the order of things that existed and overcome them. Now, as you think about this, he was coming to restore order and a law. For instance, he says in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. You know, right now, I just, I've been reading in the paper, and I'm very concerned about this situation. Of course, we're all concerned about the Middle East, but I'm very concerned about this situation in uh, far eastern Europe, in Ukraine. You know, most of the major wars that have affected us in this last two centuries have originated from that area of the world. And in case you're not paying attention, there's a tremendous war going on over there now. The German chancellor and the French president have been down there trying to figure out how they can work out peace. Now she's coming to the U.S. What do you think she's coming to the U.S. for? My guess is it's to talk about that situation. Now, we're all worried about the Super Bowl, and we're worried about the Kardashians. You better start reading the paper and worrying about some other things. There's some undercurrents out there that are pretty serious you're not paying attention to. But what I want to talk with you about is, do you suppose that that, peace that they're working on is the peace God was concerned about? No, they're trying to organize peace based on the world order of things, the way the world thinks. The Lord was in contrast with the way the world thinks. And so he says here, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Not by that system of thinking that you've created. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus was in conflict with the world order. We've cre we try to create here in this world a peace, but Jesus is offering something the world couldn't even approach. You know, the premillennialists, big word, let me help you with that. These people believe that Jesus is going to return to the earth for a thousand years and there will be a thousand years of wonderful, blissful peace. We'll all have 40 acres and a mule. We'll be the mayors of cities and towns and life will be blissful here on earth. The premillennial error is working on the world order of things. <coughs> the things Jesus came to be in conflict with and to change completely. It's trying to make peace the same way the German Chancellor is trying to make peace. And I applaud her efforts, by the way. The peace of Jesus has already been accomplished through his sacrifice. Look with me, if you would, in Ephesians 2. Oh, let's... Okay, we're looking at fish. <laughs> I get tied up in a whole lot of things and probably I'm trying to work too much scripture into this. Uh, as we go, come on here, computer, don't go dead on me. I want to pick up something else. I wanted to, before you, I know you're turning with me. I think you are. Go to Ephesians 2. Go with me to John 14. Go back there. I'm sorry. Keep your finger there and we'll go back there eventually. I want to read a little bit more of that. 
to try to show you the context of this passage in John 14. He says uh, uh, at the end of verse 27, let's read verse 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. You think he was just the captain of the globe? No. The devil's described here as the prince of this world. He's the one who has designed this order of things. He's the one that lied to Eve. He's the one who has lied to us, murdered us throughout all these centuries. That's the order he suspects, he, he uh, uh, prospers in and presides over. The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Now then, let's go to Ephesians 2. And we'll pick up our thought. He says, we are his workmanship. Here's the peace the Lord came to establish. We're his workmanship. He's created something new, a new order of things here on this earth. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is uh, called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where you were. That was the order of things. <coughs> but now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He changed, altered the order of things. The world. So that now you and I could be his servants, saved and experience a peace that the world could not give us. You might move with me just a little bit further in those thoughts to another passage this one in Colossians 1 and verse 12 giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance and the saints of light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness now any other passage he would describe that is the world he delivered us from the power of darkness the prince of this world and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By him are all things created, heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. Uh, by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. It pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. So on he goes throughout this. The idea is that he has changed the world order. He's overcome the power of darkness. He's made peace for us, verse 20 says. He made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. The premillennialist imagines that somehow the world order of things in the future will be this peace. But the Lord wasn't concerned about this earth. And he's already established this peace. You know, you need to realize the globe didn't sin. <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The globe wasn't in trouble. The universe had done nothing wrong. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. 
Now, do you understand how that word world is being used? I'm trying to emphasize it so you see. When it says he sent his son into the world, he's talking about among us. He's talking about subject to this order of things. He became flesh and dwelt among us, First John said, or John said. And so he sent him into the world. It doesn't say he sent him to, he's not saying he sent him to the globe. That was incidental. He sent him down here as one of us. <coughs> he became flesh. That's what he said in John 1. This is John 3, just two chapters later. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He wasn't here to condemn all of us. But that the world... Through him, he's not talking about saving the globe. We're not talking about green peace here. But that the world through him might be saved. The order of things, the way it was, was going to be changed. That law of sin and death, that condemnation that damned us all and that held us in bondage to that. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the same name of the Son of God. This is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That evil order of things, the light could not penetrate. The world isn't referring to the salvation of the planet. The order of things needed correction. The world was following pride and lust and selfishness. We read about that in 1 John 2. On a path to destruction. In, 1 John, in John 1, 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of why does he add that? The sin of the world. He was changing that pathway of pride and sinfulness, that idea of lust and selfishness. He was destroying that. That's the way the world thinks. He was offering us something different. In John 1 and verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What do you think John 3, 16 is telling? God sent his son into the world. He sent him here among us to be one of us. Jesus came to this order of things, to the world, not just to the planet, to give us deliverance from it. He came to provide a victory over the hopelessness of the plan that existed here on this earth at that time. The hopelessness of selfishness and lust and pride. That's what 1 John 2 says is what's in the world. Ecclesiastes and Proverbs speak of it over and over again as vanity. His dying prayer was not my will, but thine be done. That ultimate act where selfishness, was completely overcome. Not my will, but thine. A new order of things. Showing us a way to be forgiven and a new way to live. The ultimate rejection of the world's principles of ambition and selfishness and lust and pride. But there's an argument. An argument. Some say that while Jesus was here on earth, Jesus really only appeared to be human. God came to this earth on several occasions, we're told, and appeared to be human. But he was still God, completely. 
functioning, fully functioning. For instance, uh, not only appearing to be in human, he would have used all his powers. For instance, the figure of God appeared to Belshazzar. God walked, is said to have walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. God is said is to be one of the angels that appeared to Abraham. Is that what happened with Jesus? He only appeared to be human? He was still fully functioning as this as God. He wasn't one of us. He wasn't one of us. And yet we just read in John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we read in John 3 that he sent his son to the world. Well, if that's true, then he was no part, of, no more part of the world than he ever was. Do you understand that? God, before he was on this earth, before his son was here, knew what the world order was, but he was no part of it. He didn't destroy it. He, from the inside, he could have destroyed it and still been in heaven the way he was. He was no part of the world. But at the same time, how then could the Father have sent his Son to the world? Couldn't have done it. He could have been just as powerful wherever he was and done what he did if he did it by the power of God. But he became flesh and dwelt among us. If he was not tempted as we are tempted, how could he be said to have overcome the world? Look with me in a couple of other passages. For instance, Hebrews 4, verse 15. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And if you drop on just a little bit further into Hebrews 5, every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. Did you notice? Every high priest taken from among men. The high priest had to be taken from among men. Had to be one of us. And verse 15 said, we have a high priest able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Verse 2 of Hebrews 5 says, he can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. For he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Jesus, God sent his son to the world. He became flesh and became one of us. Final passage this morning. This is in John 16, and this may help you to understand it. Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. We still live in the world. We still live among selfishness, lust, ambition, pride. It flows all around us. Impossible to get away from. It's in our movies. It's in our newspapers. It's in our eyes. It's in our. It. it we have to fight against it in our thinking. In the world, you'll have tribulation. This order of things is still here. But the Lord has given us peace and a way to escape. He says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He showed us the way out. You know, in 1 Corinthians, the Lord says that we should... Well, I'm going to refer to it and not be able to quote it. Pardon me. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 5. I believe that's where it is, where I want. 
Well, I've been wrong before. <laughs> and will be wrong many other times. <sighs> mm. How foolish. I should have put this up here on my computer before I started. Yeah, 10. I just needed to double it. I'm watching a television show now where the lead character of it is developing Alzheimer's. And I'm beginning to see symptoms. <laughs> First Corinthians 10. Look with me at verse uh, 13. He said, uh, we'll look at verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Jesus came to the world to give us an escape, so that we could be forgiven, we could live in hope. We could live in peace. We could know that he had overcome for us and that we were not condemned to death by the power of the devil. And so even though we are here amid all the sin that exists in this world, we can live in peace in our minds, knowing that the Lord has paved the way and showed us and given us the escape. Are you here this morning? Not a Christian? Not having made use of the escape he's given? <clears throat> Believe, repent, confess his name, and come and be baptized while we stand and sing. <laughs> Now I'm coming home, the paths of sin.